everyone, and thanks again for joining us at the 2023 Sloan Sports <laughs> Analytics Conference. My name is Anna Yi, and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our panel, Social Media and Sports, How Consumption and Fanhood is Changing. Our panelists today are Catherine Kyling Frederick, Chief Marketing Officer at the LA Rams, Tim Clark, Senior Vice President and Chief Digital Officer at NASCAR, and Katie Daly. Vice President of Social Media at ESPN. Our panel will be moderated by Carlos Kesvers from Ticketmaster, and the panel will run for 45 minutes with 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Please submit questions on Twitter using the <coughs> hashtag sports social media. Questions will then be selected by the moderator. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Carlos. Thanks, Anna. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Awesome panel that we have here today. And I did want to start just by thanking the planning committee, everybody at Sloan. Uh, this has been an incredible experience and we're only a couple hours into the conference. So it's very exciting to spend the rest of the weekend with some great content. And speaking of content, uh, nothing bigger than social media. And so we we're very excited to have some industry experts here across multiple areas of live entertainment to talk about their business and some things that we're seeing for the future. So um, as you said, uh, if you have questions, Please put those up on Twitter with the hashtag sports social media, and we will go ahead and get going. So Kat, I'm gonna start with you. How has social media changed and evolved, and how have you seen that affect fandom? I mean, I think social media has become the avenue to engage youth um, at scale. And I think we think about youth as a monolithic audience. But if anything, it's become really diverse and segmented. And so how you activate who you're going after has evolved significantly. And so I think for us, it's really been about what are our brand objectives? What are our performance objectives? And how do we use these channels um, and these opportunities to get at the heart of that fandom and activate and grow? And since this is a sports analytics conference, I have a, a stat here because we, I started at social at ESPN years ago um, and we surveyed fans in 2018, 42% said that they used um, social media to follow sports. And then again, surveyed the same question last year and it was 89%. Without. So I mean that it really in my career, it's gone from being thought of as more supplemental and more hey, this is another megaphone for you to push push out. I hate that term, by the way. Um, but existing content or content that was created for other platforms, and now it is its very clearly its own distinct thing, and, and it's a starting point for so many fans in sports. Tim, are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh I would argue that it's it's in many ways become the new form of marketing. It's the tip of the spear for communication and coordination and messaging and, and engagement, um, which I, I think that that trend took some time. But then when we got here, we got here quick, and 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 the the level of dialogue and communication that happens through these social channels, certainly for for brands and leagues and teams, is is you know a of the utmost importance. Mm -hmm. And I think Kaylee brings up a good point. It is not a broadcast channel anymore. It is this constant two-way engagement. And in, in a lot of ways, at, at least for our season ticket member base, you see them use it as a way to help one another right. yeah. celebrate their fandom, mm -hmm. um, get more information. It is both uh, brand and transactional in a lot of ways, but it creates a sense of community as well. And so many people are having that second screen while the game's going on, mm -hmm. which I think 10 years ago, that was a no-no. We, we didn't want that at all. And now it's enhancing mm -hmm. the experience a little bit. So I, are, are you operating and doing similar things in venue when it I comes to that? I think a lot of it is uh, presenting opportunities, either social opportunities or fan engagement moments, whether that's AR, Snapchat, whatever. Um, through the lens of that in-game experience. So how do you supplement it in a way where fans want to pull it if it is a, an additional incremental experience they want to have in the bowl or at home and providing those plethora of opportunities and services so that fans can deepen their engagement on their own terms? 
Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a huge part around social engagement, which is it's all on their terms. Mm -hmm. So how do you present those opportunities in, in new and novel ways and listen and think about the next uh, service and offering that comes off of the back of that? Yeah. Uh, you, you brought up a little earlier about youth and obviously, so Katie, I'm gonna turn to you. How are you attacking various mediums by audience? Obviously there's, yeah. And Twitter has their audience and TikTok has their audience. How, how are you putting that plan together? Yeah, we absolutely will study the audience makeup by platform. But one of the things we found that works the best is really measuring and, and tracking content trends and how those show up differently on different platforms. So one of the things we've noticed across all platforms is that nostalgia works very, very well. But nostalgia on Twitter is very different than nostalgia on TikTok. So for the start of the NBA season, we did um, a That's So Raven edit for <laughs> Disney fans in the house. And we saw that on Twitter, skewing a little bit older for us, um, it kind of hit that millennial nostalgia nerve. It did really well. Didn't do as well on other platforms. Um, just the other day, we posted uh, John B. from Outer Banks at a at an NBA game on TikTok, and I was like, "That's like season one Outer Banks is nostalgia for Gen Z in a way." Um, so we think about those those different content trends and how they they show up on platform for sure. So raise of hands, how many of you guys thought that's so Raven was going to come up on a panel? Yeah, and, uh, or or <laughs> Outer Banks. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, Tim, same question to you about audiences. Um, NASCAR demographic is a little bit different. How, how are you attacking that? That was your nice way of saying older. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> a little different. Uh, yeah. Not my words. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I mean, look, I, I think we, we lean into that. I think there's, there's benefits for, for various pieces of, of, uh, of the audience. And, you know, I, I think our TV audience skews a little bit older. And, and while we're, we're certainly looking to, to you know, uh, make that fan base as broad as it can be, I, I think it's also, you know, uh, the, the 18 to 24 demo is great right up until you need them to make a purchase. Um, and, and so I think having, a, you know, those segments of the fan base that you can appeal to through different channels, and certainly broadcast is one. Um, but, you know, to Katie's point, the, the engagement that we've seen on, on TikTok, and you can use that for a lot of reasons. Look, I mean, there, there, are, um, there are ebbs and flows to the sport of NASCAR like there are any others. Uh, I think we're, we're in the midst of a bit of a resurgence. I think the whole motorsports category is seeing that. Mm -hmm. So if we can use channels like TikTok as 101 content where you've, you've got fans that are just now paying attention and we're, we're able to, to strike up that conversation for the first time, that's going to look different than what we do on a Facebook or a YouTube. Okay. And it doesn't mean that, that one's more or less important than the other. It's just a, a, a programming strategy from, from one to the next. Uh, so transitioning a little bit about um, where does social media live within your organization? And we talked last week, and this was one of my favorite questions because I go backwards to my time on the team side where I got introduced to the content calendar and how important things need to fall in place. So Kat, can you talk a little bit about how you balance the sales team wanting sales content and partnerships wanting stuff that's been committed uh, and, sure. and community relations? How, how does the balance work? Um, I think my sales team in an ideal world would like to live a little bit more like NASCAR. Um, but, you know, I think in reality what we've had to do is think of social as the thing that has had to force us to think differently about content. Um, and so when we think about brand and we think about content, you think about who you're trying to engage with that content and work backwards. And so in a lot of ways we say to um, our community team that certainly has a lot of asks of uh, marketing in our studios group, um, as well as our partners, why, why is everyone here on the platform? Why are fans here to understand and better engage with us? They're there for access. They're there for um, to be aligned with a brand that has values. And so when we think about that, we, we remain focused from a content strategy perspective on what does the brand need to impart to our fans and how do we then layer in community? How do we layer in our partners to be part of that full core press 
rather than thinking of them as distinct silos of engagement because that does our partners no service. That doesn't tell our community story in the best, most impactful way. But when we think about the convergence of that, um, it's really important in how we tell our story. For example, um, there's a piece that's coming um, that, that really brings together uh, uh, some of our community internship along with how we're impacting the community at large. It is tied to a, a partner and a sponsor, but it is a brand story at its very core. Um, so stay tuned for a, for a Bank of America story coming from the Rams that I think really does elevate the way um, we tell community stories. But the other element of it is it's not one piece that then gets blasted on every social channel exactly the same way. And so it is really about making sure that the content the fans access and the medium match. And a lot of that is just, it's education, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's educating um, your partners internally and externally on um, what's moving the needle and then also some of the opportunity costs. If you only, for, for us, you know, our social specialists only have so much time in a given day to create so many things. So if everybody's priority is the most important, then we're really watering down the, that end product. So we like to think about it through the lens of um, what's going to engage the audience, what's going to lead to audience expansion, and what's going to grow the business. Right. If you, like if you really distill it down to those things, you can have a mix. But also, I tell our team all the time, it's OK to say no to some things. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're in a position of, um, you know, there's so many different shows and sports and talent looking for support um, and we want to do it, but we, we want to do it through the lens of those three things. Great. So Tim, I'll, I'll rephrase a little bit for you, but can you talk about how, since you've got your hands in so many different things, about how maybe the analytics team is working with social or other areas in that sense to help some of that decision making? Yeah, in, in a... Um weird Mad Lib style organizational chart, uh, our consumer data strategy group and the content both uh, live in, in my organizational structure. And that was done intentionally for, for exactly that reason. Um, you know, again, back to the notion of, uh, of, of content and specifically social content being the tip of the spear. You know, the, I think the point we're all agreeing on is, is the, the channel mix is very important, the, the programming for those channels. And the only way we're going to know that is through the data that, that we're, we're, we're getting back from our fans. And I, I think we, not to overuse you know, the, the idea of a transaction, but I think that data is in many ways transactional, but not in, the, in the, 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 maybe the typical sense, right? It's more, if we're going to get data from our fans or our consumers, whether they be new or casual or, or avid, then I think the exchange of that is to give them a personalized experience. And, and again, more often than not, that's gonna happen through social media channels. So uh, I, I think if, if we're going to, if we're gonna collect this data, if we're gonna maintain it, if we're going to continue to invest in it, then, then certainly the responsibility is to use it effectively on, uh, on content channels. Got it, so Tim, sticking with you a little bit and keeping the theme around, you know, the idea of a social media campaign or something, can you walk us through when someone comes up with the idea to then when it actually gets activated? With, without giving away the, the secret sauce of what you guys do so well, how, how, does, how does that process look? Well, if, if you've ever seen a, a NASCAR race, we're very subtle about our branding. Um, <laughs> so uh, that, that is in many ways a bit of a blessing, right? So uh, uh, especially from, a, from an activation standpoint with one of our partners and sponsors, we can tell that story in a little bit more of an authentic way. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the planning of it, I, I, I'll be honest, and I'm, I'm interested to hear, uh, you know, what, what you guys think. It's we've gone both ways from the over planning to the let's not even have a content calendar. Let's just live in the moment. And I think you can make pretty strong arguments for both. Um, you know, certainly it's it's um, it's a little bit daunting for for the business person to to not have a, a calendar or, or a guide, but. Uh, I also think if, if you look at the nature of how social media unfolds organically on a day-to-day, -day, hour by hour, minute by minute basis, then the idea of trying to run that selfishly through your content calendar is, is a bit of a... Um, Fallacy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think in all good things, getting to 60 to 75% fidelity on any given week around what you know you want to put out there, what you know you have an opportunity to kind of peel back the kimono and share with fans, that's part of it. But you have to live in the moment. I mean, all of us live in live sports. And so with that in mind, how do you then use the opportunity to activate, whether it's, you know, Jalen Ramsey pulling up to Vamos Rams in a full mariachi um, outfit? How do you capitalize on that moment? Uh, because that's what's more likely to see sort of the audience expansion that you're talking about. Um, because you're living in that moment, you're celebrating that moment, um, as opposed to, well, um, we're going to get to that in three weeks because I had space on the content calendar because I jammed it to 110% at any given week. I'm very anti-content calendar, by the way. It's, it's, <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting to jump in and say, I mean, I think you can, obviously, if you know there's a big LeBron scoring milestone, right. like in our world, we're going to have something planned for that. But Increasingly, the things that are taking off um, are, you know, news-driven, event, live event-driven. So something happens, and, and you just react, um, or they're they're trend-driven. Um, you start to see memes popping up um, about something that, even if you planned for a particular event, right? Like you didn't plan that that was going to be the meme. Um, so we like to build in. You know, we have a we do have a calendar with creative for different scenarios. But for the most part, it's um, what we do is, is reactionary across the brands. Yeah, I think, I mean, on the flip side of that, if you have an, a season seat license renewal deadline, like those things have to yes. get planned yeah. through. And so, but you want to make sure um, you can still be in the moment and realize if this is going out there, then how do I then pace these other things that are more sort of trend and news yeah. alongside that and how do I also think through my sort of long-term planning my bigger brand campaigns how do I how am I going to land that in the climate that we're living in at any given moment right. um, and so I think that there's that real-time nature of is it now mm -hmm. do I wait do I give this a minute to breathe or so on it also makes sense for it to be different, right? Yeah. For a league, for a team, and, and for, for media. So I for think sure. the answer is it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Well, I'm so happy you guys kept using the word moment because we, we've talked a lot about the moment. And in my uneducated head, I, Mac McClung wins the dunk contest. And I see Katie pushing the buzzer like in Ghostbusters, and people are sliding down the pole and saying, go, go, go. And I know that's not the case. So. How does, how does that work for you? And then also, how do you plan how long that moment should live? Yeah. Is it days, is it hours, is it? I mean, that's another space where analytics comes into play. Because we, we have, I call them like algorithm astrophysicists. We have people on the team who are looking at how is a post performing at 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and then really you know, making a call in that moment, like, hey, this is taking off we need to go heavier, we need to do three more, or we need to try a different treatment, a zoom in treatment, a photo treatment on a, on a different platform. Um, and it, it, it's very, it is very different by platform. Um, in that particular example, you know, we've, we've found for TikTok, mostly your engagement, um, or our engagement to date has been for you page, and then um, increasingly SEO. And so you're, you could see TikTok views and engagement racked up a month after you've posted something. So it's really critical that on that platform you're thinking through, you know, will this be relevant in a search term a month from now? Um, and it's not quite that evergreen on the other platforms, but we do ask all social specialists to um, question when they're posting, will someone the next day turn to their friend and say, did you see this? Because there's just there's a lot of volume, there's a lot of noise out there in, in social channels, and um, we believe in like an impact over volume mentality. Where um, I would rather someone take a little bit longer on a particular edit that is going to be seen, you know, for days later, um, than you know putting up singles, mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of singles in a row. So that's what's worked for us. I know again some 
some brands approach it differently. Um, but that question of like, will someone be talking about this the, the next day has been pretty critical. Uh, Tim, how about for you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the advantage that, that probably the three of us share to a certain degree is, is being the authoritative voice, which maybe lessens the, the importance of being first. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't, I don't think you can be so late that you're, you know, you've, you've missed the point, you're irrelevant, mm -hmm. but I do think it, it, you, you can kind of take a beat and, and make sure that, that this is not only going to live in the moment, but, you know, as Katie said, is, is it going to be something that's relevant a day from now, a week from now, or a month from now? Um, I, I think, um, you know, the, the, the point that Katie made about the historical and kind of throwback, I think is really interesting because sometimes you can, you can use that throwback to, to bring the conversation back to what's happening today. I mean, for us, we're in the midst of our 75 year anniversary. So you've got 74 years of, of things that have happened that you can relate to, to what's happening today. And it's not just the content that we're posting, it's also, and Kat, I know you made this point, the, the community of it all. I think, you know, when you, when you go to a, a sporting event or a game or a match or a race, whatever the case may be, and you get uh, a selfie with, with your favorite driver or player or high five or whatever the case may be, the virtual version of that is when a brand or a team or a league communicates with you on social right. media. So, so us liking a post or commenting back on a, on a comment and, and so that it's, it's the two-way conversation and not just you know, us speaking towards fans. I, th I think that's where, where we've seen a shift change in, in how our fans consume our social content. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think part of it is also where you sit in the ecosystem. I mean, to build off what you just said, most of the time, the team isn't the one breaking the news. That's the Adam Schefters and Ian Rappaports and Tom Pelissero's of the world. But my role is to then say, based on this is who the person we drafted, here's what I can tell you, the richness of their story, the richness of where they came from, here's their family's reaction to it, a lot of this content that we, we share. But really being able to be the, uh, to your point, the authoritative figure on how do I get you a deeper relationship with that person, helmet off, how do you better understand, yes, Absolutely, Jalen Ramsey is a lockdown corner, but at the end of the day, he's a girl dad. He's very invest, like has has a um, huge appetite for our Rams mariachi. Like, how else can I dimensionalize who this person is as a person? The you know the, with the shift in in fantasy and sports betting, a lot of fandom comes in a lot of different formats. Whether that's to the player, to the team, to the sport, to the experience that I have when I'm there, and how do we serve all of those, um, but also serve the brand at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's so wonderfully said. I, I live in Oklahoma City, I'm a huge Thunder fan, and what I've seen, especially for the Thunder and someone like Shea Gildas-Alexander, fashion is Absolutely. a huge part of it, and what they're walking into the arena wearing, and how that is driving engagement, but also bringing in a very unique fan base mm -hmm. to um, maybe they don't even like sports. Maybe maybe they're all in on, on the fashion side. And does that translate to ticket purchasing or something like that? Hopefully, but I don't know. So can you talk about the width a little bit of it's not just the, the athletic performance, but a little it, deeper? It absolutely, I mean, fashion, in LA, you get fashion, culture, sport, entertainment, and, and our players, coaches, staff, they all have opinions on all of it. And so some of this is really trying to capture some of that in motion, not only when they're walking in, but you know, one of my favorite social pieces is where our players comment on one another's fashion mm. and their take on it. And you know, uh, you know whether it's Jalen or Bobby or, or Aaron, they all have opinions on what one or the other is showing up at the venue in. Um, and being able to, to leverage that, leverage their interests, right? Yesterday we hosted um, a podcast with Matthew Stafford uh, at the Microsoft offices, but it was really about Women's Empowerment Month um, and how we can, how he as a girl dad of four mm -hmm. is, is thinking to the future about how he influences, um, you know, the way they see the world. And, 
those are experiences that I think are unique access that the team can provide. And I think that we have a responsibility to help them tell their stories as well. Katie, how about to you? Traditionally, where a lot of your time is spent with the in-game aspect of things, mm -hmm. do you find you and your team leaning into those sides of, of the business? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Gen Z, in addition to being the most diverse generation, they also, their interests are incredibly diverse, right? They're, they're less likely to identify, and this, to your earlier point, they're not a monolith right. youth. But um, in general, our, our fantastic research team has shared with us that they're they're less likely to identify as like just a jock or just someone who's interested in fashion, right? They care about music, they care about gaming. And so when our content can be reflective of that, um, we, we have more success. And the other thing that lends itself well to that trend is that content creation has become very decentralized, right? You're not seeing that it's only the big media players um, or even the teams that mm -hmm. can create engaging, authentic content, there's fans out there, right? Users who are just capturing a moment, who are creating something. And so um, we've seen for sure that our younger audience is really gravitating toward that more authentic, grainy. Um, when Caitlin Clark hit her amazing shot the other night, we had a social specialist there. And that like shaky phone, cell phone video outperform like any broadcast um, footage. So we're definitely, we're seeing not only that like diverse interest, but also content format and the content format being more authentic. Mm -hmm. Tim, how about for you guys with drivers out of the car, helmet off? Yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's tough, right? I mean, you're, you've got, I think to a certain extent, all of sports, certainly the um, you know, football and, and, and NASCAR at the top of the list, uh, getting under the helmet and then the fire suit and the flame <laughs> retardant head sock and uh, all of that is, is a bit of a challenge. But um, I think we've, we're, we've become more comfortable as a sport with over the last three to five years is we were very focused on the drivers that were finishing up front. So if you were winning or competing for a win, we felt like that was the, 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 the group of personalities that we needed to build on. And I think we, we recently just got more comfortable with leaning into the personalities because mm -hmm. ultimately that's what, what people care about. It's, you know, uh, the, the number of people that can tell you, uh, you know, the average finishing position of their favorite driver pales in a comparison to someone that just appreciates getting to know someone. And it's not just the drivers. I think what, what we've, we've also found, um, you know, a perfect example, we had Tiffany Haddish at the Daytona 500, had never been to a NASCAR race. And, I think both sides are kind of feeling that out. Like, is this going to work? Is she going to hate it? Is, is you know, how is this this going to unfold? And she had a blast. So the next race was was in Fontana, uh, right outside of L.A. And she, on her own, was like, I want to come. So she, you know, now mm -hmm. two weeks in a row, she's at a NASCAR race, her first two NASCAR races ever, and she's telling those stories, you know, to her fans on her platform. So whether it's drivers, whether it's crew chiefs, I mean, the the more comfortable we as a sport can become with where those personalities come from and how they're telling their stories, the, the better off we're going to be. And it's, it's, you know, again, it's, it's going to come from the non-traditional places. The more time we spent looking at the top five or the top 10 as the, the beginning and the end of, of what stories we were going to tell, it, it made our jobs much harder. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of making your jobs harder, Kat, to you, are there things that you guys used to do or that you've seen traditionally that don't work anymore? Or have you had to transition or pr pivot strategies or even content on certain platforms that you find just I mean, aren't quite connecting? I think, I, as, as I said earlier, the channels have, have really pushed us upstream to think about content differently. Um, I, I think the days of old where you could create it, blast it, move on, you know, those are gone. And so it really is about constantly thinking about what you can present out in the world, doing a lot of testing around that. Is that better in video? Is that, can we, can we just put it on a cell phone? Can we uh, think through whether or not we want really much more of a gallery type experience? Um, and then letting the data, letting our fans be the ones who really drive the how. We know, like, our job is to articulate the breadth of the what. This is what we can give people access to. This is um, 
Is it about dimensionalizing the amazing experience at SoFi? Is it about the players? Is it really about better understanding how a football team does what it does? The things where um, your, you know, being able to go pro your radio announcer at, at major moments, that, that's so small and so easy and the barrier to do it is non-existent. And it, it crushes on social. Mm. So you start to think differently about how do I give myself space and how do I give myself more opportunity to grab those moments, knowing that on the team side, unlike at ESPN, we don't have that scale in terms of resources. We just have to be able to catch lightning in a bottle. And so how do you set yourself up for that versus how do I have a very concrete calendar of content that I'm gonna push out, this is gonna go at nine, and this is gonna go at 11, and we're just not living in that world anymore. Mm -hmm. And you have to be incredibly nimble because mm -hmm. you're, in social, the platforms are making the rules of the road. You know, so if Meta decides like Reels is the thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> then, then your, your content shifts. needs to start being, you know, a little bit more vertical video heavy. Right. Um, and, and I just, continue to tell the team, like, we do have to stay ready for whatever those changes are. The core elements, the core DNA of stories, highlights, um, player content, all of that is going to be there, but that format is just going to change. Yep. Yeah. Tim, you have your hands in Web3 and a lot of the other type of digital community aspects of things, and not quite the textbook definition of social media, but obviously it's, it's engagement, it's community, and it's, it's driving fandom. Can you talk a little bit about how you guys strategize around that? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I'm contractually obligated to use the word metaverse once per panel. <laughs> <laughs> relevant and smart, so glad we got that out of the way. Um, I, I mean, I think one of the reasons that, you know, back to the idea of this, this maybe atypical organizational structure mm -hmm. that, that the Web3 business was really appealing is because I think ultimately what it is is about the, the user and it's it's more gaming culture than than anything. And I think of, of any category or any space that I think is the closest to having it figured out, I, I do think it's it's within the gaming culture. I think that you know we've explored um, platforms like Discord um, as as kind of a you know a, a beta test. I don't I don't know what what we're going to get out of this. I don't know what we have to offer to our fans, but. You know, one of the things we have on, on race day is we've got uh, live in-car audio for, for each of the drivers. So putting that on a content platform like Discord where that type of medium is more familiar to the audience, I think the reception was, was very positive. So whether it's, whether it's NFTs or, or crypto or, or whatever, you know, you want to put in this broad category that, that uh, gets, you know, emotions one way or the other from most people, I think what it really boils down to is, is gaming culture for us is, you know, a, an audience that, um, you know, seems to have, have settled into a rhythm of, of creating content, consuming content, um, and, and really being the one that is a, a bit of an arbiter on what's going to work and what isn't. Kat, how about for you guys? Can you, can you speak a little bit on that? From a metaverse perspective, you know, I think for us, there's, within the league, there's a, a number of opportunities for us to continue to explore. But it's really about listening to what the fans want, right? The fans have continued. Um, yes, there are collectibles and NFTs and, and things of that nature. Um, but from a, from a Web3 perspective, I don't think... Um, we are sitting as a first mover, um, uh, as well as not being a first mover on sort of the clubhouse trend. There, I think when you're lean, you become extraordinarily pragmatic about where does fandom meet your brand agenda, meet your opportunity to give people um, sort of that that dialogue around the right things. And, and for us, there's been a lot of capitalizing on that in the two years that I've been there. Um, first year, you know, winning the championship, taking home the chip. Um, there's a lot of stories to unpack there. Mm -hmm. And it's been awesome. Uh, cool. Katie, uh, can you talk, you, you've mentioned vertical formats and yeah. that being a little bit of a, a not a trend, it's, it's relevant, but <laughs> Are there other trends and things that you've seen? 
Yeah, um, I would say the, the biggest one in the last several years would be the rise of the creator economy. Um, I referenced it earlier, but just this notion of a consumer preferring a recommendation from um, an individual over a brand. And for us, that started with um, working with ESPN talent and, and their social strategy um, and really thinking about, okay, if you're going to find out about a game or a show and you hear it from talent as opposed to hearing it from the brand, um, are you more likely to engage? What we found was yes, that was the case. Um, and then last year we launched ESPN's first ever influencer program, ESPN Creator Network. Um, worked with 10 micro influencers, gave them access to campus, to events. Um, we had a course curriculum built for them and there was a lot of shared learning there. So um, I have a ton of heart. We're, we're in the process of planning a year two, but I have a lot of heart for how can we continue to learn from individual creators in the sports space um, and sort of tap into their superpower of building community um, and connecting with communities on social channels with our superpower of access, rights, um, stats and information, analytics, et cetera. And I think as the waves come through, right, as the creator economy has become such a dominant part of um, social conversation. I think that there is also a responsibility to play the other side. Mm -hmm. And so for us last year, um, as we were going through the draft, um, we didn't have a pick, I don't think, Kevin, until the tail end of day two. Um, even then, might have traded out of day two into day three. So coming into that opportunity, knowing you wanted to be part of that conversation, we went the other way, away from the creator economy, did a huge draft production, right? A draft film uh, heist teaser, leveraged celebrity talent from Tyrese to Randy, uh, to Dennis Quaid, to, to Scott Eastwood to play our front office staff, um, uh, our coach uh, and, and our GM. And that gave us an opportunity to tell stories up and down our fan base from our diehards who were able to explore it for Easter eggs. And, oh, well, did you see on the chalkboard that Aaron Donald was writing on? That was the final score of the Super Bowl. So being able to unpack that, being able to unpack the bloopers from that for our, for our fan base, I think that that also gave us kind of that mixed complexion of what you were gonna see from us on social as well. Um, and really gave the fan base something to talk about when we weren't actually gonna be transacting over those two days and really you know, endeavor to break the internet before we're even in the conversation. That was on the content calendar. That was on the content <laughs> calendar a year in advance. Um, but, but, but those are how you kind of have to play it where you're not just thinking about how do I capture that moment and live from moment to moment, but also insert how do I create a moment? How do I make a moment? And how do I, right. how do I um, insert myself where I have no business being? Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's, I think, some of the real fun of it all. Which I think is, is tougher than a lot of people give credit to, is staying out of the moment, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's, there's plenty of of things that happen, and whether it's pop culture, entertainment, whatever the case right. may be, that, that every brand, every team, every league feels they, they've got the best idea and they need to dive into it. Like, I, I think, you know, the, one of the best piece of advice uh, that I ever received was, you know, that, that thing that you're thinking about doing on your social channels for April Fool's Day, just don't just do don't. it. <laughs> yeah, uh, just and I, I think that advice probably carries through to a lot of areas. Yeah, and, and I think even now, as we think about you know, gearing up for this season, there are a lot of, I think, really fun, potentially fan forward ideas, but you also have to layer it into what's right for the business right now. And maybe part of that is pulling back and thinking about, okay, well, maybe we'll take a more traditional stance on this, but we'll really lean in, in a more progressive way in another moment, in another tentpole. Um, 
And so to your point of being ready all the time, we need to have those ideas. We need to, have to build that muscle memory on how to get active in that moment, but we're not gonna do it right now. I'm having flashbacks to all the Be Real conversations yes. this fall with it being <laughs> Just the top don't. of the app store. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's all about what's your team's bandwidth and what's gonna, again, like drive audience engagement, drive audience expansion, drive the business. And for us, like that didn't make sense in that moment. And sure. now it feels like, right? We've the moment is off gone. that moment, clubhouse similarly. Yeah. So I think you just, you pick and choose your spots, but also we do have that luxury of being, I think you said the authorities in spaces. So um, I understand if you're a smaller brand, maybe testing and learning um, makes, makes a little bit more sense for those. So last question before we go to the audience questions, which, by the way, huge kudos to everybody. <laughs> there, there's some amazing questions in here, so we'll dive into those. Um, one of the best parts of Sloan is the student interactions. So we've got some, some young people here who are going to go out into full-time employment here shortly. For them, what advice would you give the future content creators, the people that want to find themselves on your teams uh, moving forward? How, how would you guide them today? I mean, I would say it's never been easier from a content creation perspective to stand out to someone leading a social media team. You could go start a TikTok account, scale it, show that you know how to engage an audience, show that you know content creation. And we, we have some folks we've hired in the past year that were truly like fresh out of college and just learned that skill set. And they set themselves apart by already doing the work. Um, so I think for me it's that, and then it's just to be curious and stay curious. Um, really big on that. Again, social, always changing. So the more that you can stay on top of those changes and ask questions in, in interviews, and again, even after you get the job, ask questions. Um, those are two that I would say. Good subtle Ted Lasso drop there. I don't even know if you realize it. You said be curious, not, not, yeah. <laughs> I do love good. Ted Lasso, <laughs> it was not on yeah, purpose. <laughs> Tim? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, Katie's answer is good. I'm, I'm just going to steal it. Um, I, I think, you know, if you look at all of these different platforms and mediums, I don't, I don't think it's, it's changed too much, right? If, if there's someone that, you know, if, if you've got a big media platform and you see someone on a, on a smaller local news platform, whatever the case may be, then, then you're going to want to recruit them to be part of what you're doing. You know, the same with, you know, beat writers that, that you want to put on on maybe a written content platform. I think social media is just that. It's, you know, if if I look across our, um, you know, our staff, there's at least half a dozen that I can think of at the top of our head where we never saw a resume, we never saw a job application, we just saw what they were doing on their own as, as content creators on their own platforms and went and recruited them to come work mm -hmm. for us. So. I mean, I think it's it's your it's your portfolio, it's your reel, it's your resume. It's it's just you know to, to Katie's point, it's never been easier to 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 put that out there. And and certainly the 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 creativity and the content is is not easy, but but the stage is there. Um, I think it's just a matter of, of you know can you take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Kat, you're in a it's, tough spot. It, it's it's hard to go last <laughs> when the answers are so great. I mean, I I was I was at Sloan years ago, um, and, and for me it was not, I think the greatest advice was don't limit yourself, right? Be curious, be passionate about what actually drives you because that will come across, right? If you are fanatical about financial models, be fanatical about financial models. Like, let that be your thing. What is your brand? What is your, um, what is your passion? And run with it. I, I sat, I sat uh, at an IEP session at Sloan um, with the infamous uh, Jessica Gelman and Daryl Morey many, many years ago because I thought I would never end up in sports. And so might as well do the taste test of it then and look at where I'm at now. I think it, it has been my passion to chase um, other people's passions and, and deconstruct that that led me to here. And I've never been better poised to do what I do, which is to serve fans. Um, 
had it not been for just being able to chase my own passions mm -hmm. and live my work through that lens. Very cool. Well said, all three of you. That's great. Um, question time. Uh, Katie, I'm going to start with you. How do you quantify a viral tweet? A viral Or maybe tweet not tweet, maybe just a viral. Yeah, well, it depends on the platform, but I think, um, yeah, the word viral, we, we tend to, um, we, we don't love it when people say, make it go viral, because we can't do that. <laughs> but in terms of measurement, um, I can tell you, like, for Sports Center Instagram, most of last year, we were looking at, we wanted to have over half a million engagements per post. So we look at um, engagements per post as our primary KPI. Um, on Twitter, that would be more like 5,000 retweets, again, from our big multi-sport accounts. But we have um, a social averages doc that goes out every month. And for each brand, um, there, are, there are targets. And so we meet and we talk about that and we look to move up that engagements per post for each brand. So it is gonna look different for our affinity brands like an ESPNW or a sports specific brand um, like our college game day account. But I hope that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, do you guys have any other different definition? I mean, viral in a way that's positive for the brand, viral in a way that's negative. I mean, we, as, as I mentioned, we had the draft film that went out uh, Tuesday before before draft, um, and we didn't have a pick on day one. But so we so we had a nice party uh, at our draft house, um, and then after lots of cocktails, we led our GM and our head coach to a press conference. Uh, that went viral, <laughs> absolutely went viral. You know, I think that tongue-in-cheek there's viral that serves the brand and there's viral adjacent to the brand yeah. um, and so I think really understanding the intentions of what you mean when you want to go viral yeah. and people say it went viral and you're like but that's not necessarily the outcome I was really hoping for and so you live in a world in which that's your reality how do you then navigate it from there Tim, question for you. When building a social page, what's the best tip to gain followers? Oof. Um, that's a good one. I, 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 I'll, I know I gave this answer earlier, but I, I stand by it. I think the, the community engagement is the biggest piece. So the content that you're, you're posting natively is, it, it, it certainly has to meet a certain standard. But I think whether you've got 500 followers or 5 million followers, your ability to engage with those that, that are um, taking a peek at what you're doing, I think is really important because that conversation just organically grows. If it's, you know, a, a one to one, then it's going to be one to 10. And, and then, you know, it's, it's um, I, I think there's a, there's a lot that can go right and a lot can, can go wrong in that scenario, but but the simplest engagement with our fans and consumers, I mean, they're they're fanatical by, mm -hmm. by the literal definition. So, um, I th I think that's where I'd start. Yeah, if you have a smaller account commenting on a bigger account, that's like a no-brainer. Definitely get in the comments of a bigger account. I mean, it has to be adjacent to right. what your account is about. But yeah. I agree with that. I think that that engagement helps with discoverability. Kat, this fits a little bit to what you were talking about earlier, but um, with the success of shows like Drive to Survive, mm -hmm. have you explored how that content style affects your strategy where you're either building something for a social moment, but maybe that should be a longer form piece of content? I mean, I think for us, we have, we have a robust studios team that's able to capture a lot of the team um, in a brand safe way, right? Um, a lot of the teams have uh, not struggled, but like there, there's an invasiveness to a, a hard knocks coming into any club in terms of everyone getting mic'd up. But, but when you're part of the team side and you're able to capture all of this stuff in motion and they have relationships with your team, I do think that for us, it's about capture as much as you can. Be in those moments, be in that locker room, be in that weight room, um, you know, be in those moments 
during OTAs where they're with their families, and then be take a step back, is this for social? Is this a bigger narrative that we can and should be telling? And how do we then expand on that story? So I think to the, to the, back to the content calendar, you don't know what you're gonna get, but you have to be ready to either make it a small moment, a big moment, or a sort of a longer range arc, which then allows you to follow that through, longitudinally throughout the season. Um, when is the right time to be comical, serious, pithy? There, there's a question that came across about yeah. schedule release videos and oh, yes. things like that. Um, how, how do you, from an organization, manage keeping the philosophies and the culture with stuff that you know might drive engagement and, and added followers? I mean, cheap and thirsty clicks is not what we're after. Um, from a brand perspective, uh, I think, I think for us, knowing who we are, knowing who we are as a brand, there is for us, and, and we are in a two-team market, right? And so there is a natural desire for us to differentiate one from the other, us versus the chargers. Um, and I think from a brand perspective, tonally, we are very different. Um, and I think it's deliberate. Uh, we're not, we won't punch down. We won't take cheap shots. But we also aren't gonna, we will clap back if you come for us. Um, and so, you know, I think these are the rules of engagement, but then you leave enough space for your team who is sitting with those communities to do the right thing um, and, and to, to capitalize on those moments. I think being able to, be, or, or trying to prescribe really micro rules don't work. Mm -hmm. But really understanding who we are as a brand is the best way for people to then be able to autonomously make the right calls. Mm -hmm. And that's where we've spent a lot of our focus. Tim, humor works. How do you balance it? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's, you know, oddly enough, the in-race moment, which would maybe be the best time to, um, to take that humorous approach, that's the one time where, where we just are, are pretty much full stop to not. And, and a lot of that is because I think what, what we try to you know, tell new fans especially is these guys are gladiators, right? I mean, the, the men and women that, that race NASCAR are, are strapping into a car going upwards of 200 miles an hour with 38 other cars inches around them, and it is inherently dangerous. So I, I don't think, or at least we don't think that that's the right time to make light of that situation. It's more to put them you know, on a pedestal as athletes. Sure. I think literally any other time after that, once the race is said and done and everyone is safe, and then, then I think we're, we're, uh, we're more than making up for, for the lack of humor during that, that three or four hour window. Uh, yeah, we, we talk about um, how if you can hit on emotions with social posts, generally that's a successful strategy. But I will say humor is the hardest one because it's incredibly subjective. Mm -hmm. Like what I think is funny is not what you, know, you may think is funny. And then it's also different by platform. Um, mm -hmm. If you spend a lot of time on TikTok, the term unhinged is thrown around a decent amount. Like there is a certain amount of unhinged humor there um, that doesn't work in other spaces. So our main thing is to just read the room um, we have a, a team Slack channel and we're always talking about, hey, like read the room. What's the tone on Twitter where you're gonna see a lot more news coverage? You're gonna have to understand what's going on. Um, and what's the tone on, again, like TikTok where it's a lot more evergreen, it's a lot more like each individual has a different experience based on that for you algorithm. So um, I generally, yeah, humor's hard. I don't know that a lot of, um, that it's like a superpower of a lot of social specialists. Um, so for us, it's worked better when we lean into some of our personalities sure. and their humor and their, right, instead of the brand. Like our brand, generally speaking, we wanna be celebratory. Um, we don't wanna be out there dunking on athletes. Um, so I would say for us, that personal, that humor personality is gonna come more from you know, Stephen A in a cowboy's hat. Yeah. Like, he, you know, he can troll <laughs> a little bit more than a brand can. Yeah, very cool. 
absolute honor to be on the stage with you guys. Thank you so much for sharing all of the great content. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being in the room. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.